Weight cutting has been, some would say, a huge issue when it comes to combat sports in general, where athletes have to abide by weight classes and categorize themselves so they can actually compete and go about their career. But then comes the choice of which division, which weight class does an athlete decide to take? Will it be the lower weight class where they could have a size advantage over their opposition, but risk the weight cutting that comes with it? Or they'll go up to the higher weight class where they'll take another risk of being the smaller athlete in the division, but they won't harm themselves potentially inside of the contest due to the weight cuts that other athletes in the division will have to do if they decide to be the bigger person in there. So it's all about weight cutting at the end of the day when you decide to go to these weight classes. And weight cutting potentially can have massive repercussions depending on the percentage of weight you decide to cut. And when you cut weight, it's not necessarily you're cutting body fat or something like that. It's mostly you cutting water weight from your body for a small period of time. Now, there's different countless methods, whether it be get down to a certain weight through body fat from working out and all that sort of stuff to then begin the weight cut maybe a week before your contest. Some would like to just cut the weight and that's it. Don't lose any body fat because when you're losing body fat, you're also losing muscle. So they want to just cut as much water weight as possible without compromising their muscle, compromising their actual size when they come into the fight. This is a much riskier path to take. Cutting the weight at that point could jeopardize everything. So they could do that maybe a week before the fight, maybe a couple days even before the fight. You have Chael Sonnen, Chris Weidman and even Travis Luter, these elite fighters in MMA, they have been known to at least one time cut an extreme amount of weight in a very short amount of time. Specifically, Chris Wyman, when he went to go fight up against Damian Maia at the weight of 185 pounds, he took this fight on 10 days notice, and when he signed to take the bout on such short notice, he began the process weighing 217 pounds. He had to lose 32 pounds in 10 days. And not only lose 32 pounds in 10 days, he also had to somewhat train for the fight. So it's not the entire 10 days he's cutting weight. Didn't lose any body fat, didn't lose any weight to get to a more optimal weight to start cutting weight. This was a huge toll on his body. And he explained it as his brain was quote unquote disappearing. He had no idea what was going on. He had no idea what people were telling him. He didn't really have regular cognitive function. And he said it's something he would never do again. But it was a huge opportunity for him in the beginning of his UFC career. Now, why is this such a horrible thing? Why did Wyman feel like he was on death's door making that weight? What was going on with his body? What was it doing to his body? When you're cutting weight, you're cutting water, you're dehydrating yourself. It's a severe dehydration to the point of the fight. Now, they're not staying that dehydrated the entire time. They are probably getting down to the weight they can compete in. So let's say 185 pounds. You get down to 185 pounds for maybe an hour. You are dropping that weight quickly before that. So it's not like you're staying dehydrated for a long period of time. Very short period of time, but the process to get there is terrifying. Now, water makes up about 60% of the human body. So it's a very important thing for your body to function, especially for your kidneys, because water enables your kidneys to filter blood and balance things like potassium and sodium, which allows it to function. And another huge component when you're losing the water is you could potentially get heat strokes. You lose the bodily function of, of cooling yourself off from heat. And that is sweat. You lose your ability to sweat, which loses the ability to cool yourself off from heat. This is why you sweat when you work out. You sweat when your natural body temperature temperature rises. You get it when you have flus, you get it when you work out. And in order to do this, we need water in our body. So when you're dehydrated through cutting weight, you don't sweat anymore. You eventually lose your ability to sweat if the water you're cutting is a high amount, which is why you hear people like Ronda Rousey, Paige Van Zandt, when they lose their ability to sweat, they see it as they don't know what else to do to cut the weight. Because when you lose your ability to sweat, you have really dehydrated your body from water. And when you dehydrate your body that much, there is almost nothing else to lose besides maybe fat or muscle. But then again, water is also in fat. It's also in muscle. About 75% of muscle is composed of water and about 10% of fat is composed of water. So it's a very different amount. And muscle contains glycogen, which may be the main reason for it containing a lot more water. Dieting is a huge part of the cutting system where most will go and cut carbs and cutting carbs you lose glycogen and water is actually attached to glycogen so you're also losing the water. So you're also losing water to that and there's roughly three to four grams of water attached to one gram of glycogen. So you could lose high amounts of water just from cutting carbs as well. Which is why you saw Darren Till for an example. When he was cutting weight and he went up on the scales, why did he look so much smaller in size? Muscle size. 
a lot of the water in his muscles got depleted from his body, which is why he looked a lot smaller. But then when he came on fight night, specifically looking at the Donald Cerrone fight or even the Stephen Thompson fight, he looked huge again, muscle-wise. He looked full again. This is why he regained all the water back into his body and his muscles expanded again. So at the end of the day, the more muscle you have, the more weight you can cut. This is why people like Glace and T-Bow, for an example, can cut to 155 pounds and come into fight night at around 185. Even some rumors where he came up to 192 against Terry Edom. But that, I think, is just a rumor, which is absolutely insane. And this is why you see people like maybe George St. Pierre, who has more lean muscle, isn't the biggest kind of fighter, isn't someone like Glace and T-Bow, where he has very low body fat. It's going to be a lot hard for him to cut the weight naturally, just like everybody else does through dehydration. He's going to need more of a process. And this is also his body type. He isn't so much of a mesomorph where they are naturally more muscular, naturally can develop more muscle than other people can, than let's say an ectomorph or an endomorph. Endomorph contain more fat and ectomorph are more lean and have a more difficult time building muscle. GSP's coach came out and said that GSP is more of an ectomorph. He's going to have a harder time to pack on the muscle than other mesomorphs in the sport, which makes it harder to cut water. And him walking around at mid-180s, cutting to 170 back in his prime, he wasn't cutting as much as some other fighters. I mean, we just said Glazen T-Bow. He fought at a weight class below GSP, and he naturally weighs more than GSP. Now, when I was mentioning fighters or athletes who go into the contest after the weight cuts, can it compromise their performance? Can it compromise them inside of the contest? It absolutely can. If you dehydrate yourself of too much water to the point you can't rehydrate, all that water back, you come into the fight somewhat dehydrated. It could be moderately, slightly dehydrated. If it's severely dehydrated, it most likely will come to you can't get into the fight. You can't compete. Doctors would most likely just end the process. Maybe moderately, maybe slightly dehydrated, but even at that, you lose your ability to take a punch. Your cognitive functions aren't going to be sharpest. You're not going to be your biggest in there. You're not going to be your healthiest physically. So mentally and physically, it's going to play a huge role. But that doesn't really make sense, right? Because if you can dehydrate so much water, why can't you rehydrate it back? You could dehydrate a lot of water, but to rehydrate it, you can't force it back into your body. Unless you want to cause hyponatremia or water intoxication, which is an excessive intake of water or other fluids with low sodium content. Because this can lead to low sodium rather than high sodium that hypernatremia can cause. And this can actually be even more dangerous to where it can lead to brain swelling and brain swelling can lead to many other problems, life-threatening problems. Electrolytes are the way to go to rehydrate back. So if you lose, let's say 30 pounds within 10 days like Chris Wyman did, or let's say 25 pounds just to keep it more moderately, even though that's a crazy amount as well. You can't force all that 25 pounds of water back into yourself. And a great analogy that Nicholas Rizzo made, who was a president and a board member of the Association of Reekside Physicians, he said cutting weight and then rehydrating is almost like a sponge, right? You can force out the water, but you can only rehydrate or take in the water to the sponge's speed. In a sense, you can lose water a lot easier than gaining it back which leads you to go into the fight maybe dehydrated. And what happens to your brain when it's dehydrated? I made a video about the science behind getting knocked out or taking a big blow to the head and what happens to the brain, what happens to the meninges and all that sort of stuff, the fluid that's protecting the brain from hitting the walls inside the skull. Well, when you lose the water, you lose that as well. It makes it a lot easier for the brain to slosh inside your skull and hit the walls and potentially get knocked out. Concussions will happen a lot easier and because of this, the risk of CTE also increases just because of your weight cut. Where if you have the fluid around the brain to protect it and keep it in place, if you're not dehydrated, now you can take a shot a lot better. This is why guys like Frankie Edgar, for an example, being such a small fighter, even compared to guys at 145 and 155, he could potentially fight at 135. He's able to take all these guys' shots or a lot of their shots because his brain is never compromised. His brain is always healthy. The meninges, the fluids are always healthy in his skull, right? He's able to take a shot a lot better. And then all of a sudden, you see guys like Anthony Pettis, who was once the 155-pound champion. He went down to 145, which was a drastic weight cut for him. And he fought Max Holloway, who is now the best 145-er in the entire division. And the toughness in the chin of Anthony Pettis was always very strong. He was never hurt his entire career whenever you look back at it. The only time he was really hurt was when he cut down the 145 and fought Max Holloway. He couldn't take the shots like he normally could. The body shots also did him in. Getting hit to the body, this also works itself. He came into the fight most likely somewhat dehydrated. 
couldn't take the shots to the body, especially couldn't take the shots to the head. He saw him eventually drop. He couldn't take the damage anymore against a quote unquote smaller fighter in Max Holloway. But yet he could take shots from guys like Tony Ferguson, who is huge, who walks around north of 190. He could take shots from guys like Rafael Dos Anjos, who now fights at 170. Yet he couldn't take those kind of shots from a guy like Max Holloway. It's not because Max Holloway hits harder than those guys. And Max Holloway in himself is more of a volume striker rather than a power puncher. He was so dehydrated coming to the fight, he couldn't take the shots like he normally could. The brain sloshes around in the skull, hits the walls, potentially could cause a concussion, and shuts down the body a lot easier. Just from drastic weight cuts. And Anthony Pettis came out and said, after that weight cut against Max Holloway, he decided to never go back to 145 and decided to stay at 155. And now you can see his body is a little bit compromised. When he came into the Tony Ferguson fight, for an example, now we don't know exactly what happened behind the scenes in his training camp. If his training was off, if he was injured coming to the fight, we don't know any of that. But it has an effect on the body as well. Your body now wants to hold onto the fat, wants to hold onto the muscle, wants to hold onto everything from you cutting that weight again. The body fights against what's hurting it, naturally. That's why you saw some body fat on Anthony Pettis a little bit more. You saw some, maybe a little bit more muscle behind the fat. And it seemed like he did have a tough weight cut. He was the last one to weigh in before the contest. And Anthony Pettis used to always make 155 very easily. He walks around usually at around maybe mid-170s, right? He's not even one of the bigger guys there. Guys like Habib Nurmagomedov, who is a champion of the division, can walk around north of 190. Same thing with Tony Ferguson. So... Comparing to those guys, Anthony Pettis isn't really that big. And he said after the cut to 145, he ballooned up. His body wanted to hold all the weight in. He ballooned up all the way to 205 pounds, which he said he has never came close to before in his entire life, which made this weight cut a lot harder for him. Which is why a guy like Roy Jones Jr. in boxing, one of the all-time greats in boxing, he was playing around with weight classes, playing around with cutting weight. He started as a middleweight, which is 154 pounds. Then he went up to super middleweight, which is 160 pounds. Then he went up to light heavyweight, which is 175 pounds. Then he went up to heavyweight to plus 200 pounds. Back down to light heavyweight, which is around 175 pounds. Then he went up to cruiserweight a little bit more. So he really was changing weight classes and his body did not like it. And a lot of other terrible things can happen. We have seen deaths in combat sports related to weight cuts. It's mostly because they can't take the shot afterward. They come into the fight with cognitive functions completely off. Motor mechanics completely off. Can't see the punches coming. Can't react to the punches. And now the brain can't even take the shot. You are completely made of glass at that point. And those shots can have life-threatening consequences. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video and I hope you're able to learn from this video. I know I did I do a lot of research for this and I was able to learn some stuff about this that really puts a lot of things in perspective. Weight cutting is absolutely no joke. This is why fighters say that the weight cuts are harder than the actual fights themselves. I hope you guys enjoyed this and if you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. If you enjoyed my content, make sure to subscribe. So again, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.